The Boy Who Grew Dragons by Andy Shepherd, part two. The Jam Roly Poly of Doom. Is Grandad planning on growing potatoes on your head? Mum asked when I walked into the kitchen. She pointed to my hair. You've got half the garden in there. Shower now and be quick. Tea's nearly done. I groaned, but there was no point arguing. Not when Mum had her, I will not be moved even by a runaway rhinoceros look. But I didn't make it to the shower. And not just because I spotted the latest Spider-Man comic I'd left at the bottom of the stairs and stopped to check I hadn't missed anything the first six times I'd already, I read it. But because when I went to my room to grab my dressing gown, I noticed something very odd. The dragon fruit was glowing. Properly glowing. I went over and peered down at it. Reaching out, I prodded the spiky skin. It started pulsing orange, red and blazing yellow. And then I remembered what Grandad had said about mould. Maybe it was toxic. I yanked my hand back and stared at it, half expecting my fingers to shrivel up and drop off in some fatal reaction. But they didn't. And the relief was slightly sprinkled with disappointment. Not because I wanted my fingers to fall off, but because when you've read as many comics as me, you can't help but hope that you might just absorb some superpowers when this kind of thing happens. <laughs> Not that this kind of things had happened to me, ever. The fruit stopped pulsing and now looked pretty normal, apart from the glow. Before I could prod it again, I heard Mum shouting from downstairs that tea was ready, and if no one was there to eat it in exactly 30 seconds, she was giving it all to next door's dog. And we could have cereal for all she cared. I might have taken more notice of this if the, <laughs> if the neighbours had actually had a dog, but they don't. Just a ferret, and a fussy one at that. So I doubt it would eat Mum's lasagna anyway. Dad stuck his head round my door and shouted, Tease up, Thomas! And he headed off down the hall. I waved, Just coming, Dad! I didn't bother telling him that he, need, he didn't need to shout. He wouldn't hear me. He wears a massive pair of headphones pretty much permanently. Music is Dad's job and his hobby and what he does every second in between those t times too. He writes music for commercials on TV and one very low-budget film that no one's heard of, let alone seen. But I think, secretly, he still wants to be a rock star and imagines being discovered by some TV talent or some or something. Anyway, I've got used to communicating with him mainly through mime. Aware that I hadn't made it anywhere near the shower, I swapped hoodies, then ducked into the bathroom and quickly stuck my head under the tap. Looking at the state of the sink afterwards, I wished we'd probably, after I'd finished, we'd probably be growing potatoes in there too. Meal times are interesting in our family, in our house. Not because we talk about any interesting things or anything like that, but because of my not yet three year old sister, Lolly. In particular, watching my parents trying to field the flying food and make sure that some of it at least goes into Lolly's mouth. Plus, since it's the only time that Dad doesn't wear headphones or isn't plugged into his keyboards, Mum seems to feel that she has to make the most of it by talking non-stop at about 100 miles an hour. No one could possibly process the amount of information she churns out between mouthfuls. In fact, I'm pretty sure Dad is actually composing tunes in his head while she's talking. And nodding, and the nodding that Mum takes for his agreement, is just him keeping time. After Mum wiped up the lasagna that Lolly had generously shared with the floor, she brought out the dessert. She's working her way through a cookbook that Nana gave her last Christmas, called The Great British Puddings. That night it was jam roly-poly and custard. Well, lumps of custard. The roly-poly's a bit flat, she noted, as she offered it to us apologetically. It's meant to be a nice spiral of dough and jam, you know, rather than a splodge. She was right. It looked as if someone had sat on it. 
and that wasn't unusual. Mum is a vet, you see, and although she can wrestle an uncooperative doberman <laughs> into a head cone, she can't seem to wrestle pudding ingredients into anything that resembles cake, despite all the shows she watches on TV. Of course, that could have had something to do with her leaving out half the ingredients to make it healthier. Sugar-free cake is not cake in my book. But being bombarded with shows about producing the perfect pudding, while at the same time be being programmed to make sure that everyone eats their five, five, a day fr five a day of fruit and veg, makes desserts more difficult for mum than the rest of us. I wanted to say something nice to her to make her feel better, but I'm really not great at lying. Dad was staring out, <laughs> out of the window, humming under his breath. I needed him to step in quick before I blurted out something that would probably end up making mum hurl the whole dish at the wall. Which was not necessarily a bad idea. Just then, Lolly grabbed a piece and stuffed it into her mouth, and then spat it out again. Mum looked horrified. We watched Lolly. We watched as Lolly picked up another piece, unravelled the dough and happily started licking the jam out of the middle. See? Lolly likes it, I spluttered. Mum didn't look convinced. So I dived for a piece and started making what I hoped were believably yummy noises. Mum sighed and just said, Can't you call her Charlotte for once? But she likes being called Lolly Bob. Don't you Lolly Bob Bob a lob? I replied still chewing a tasteless lump of dough. Lolly giggled and stuck out two jammy hands to me. See, I said, finally managing to swallow the leaden ball of dessert. It lodged in my throat and I had to take an enormous gulp of water to get it down. Mum turned and while she was wiping Lolly clean, I grabbed the rest of the roly-poly pudding from my bowl and stuffed it in my hoodie pocket. Thanks to my sister, I was going to be saved from eating any more... <laughs> more. <coughs> we stick together, me and Lolly, even without jam. Suddenly, there was a loud thump upstairs. Mum stared at the ceiling. Whatever's that? Oh, it's probably just Tom Tom messing with my stuff, I said. That cat is like a furry wrecking ball, Mum, Mum moaned. Go and sort out your pet, Thomas. I didn't need telling twice, not with half a roly-poly still sitting on the table staring at me menacingly. I raced upstairs. Tom Tom, come out! I said crossly as I stepped into my room. I looked around for the ginger cat, ready to give him his marching orders, but he wasn't anywhere to be seen. Then I noticed the dragon fruit wasn't where I'd left it on the desk. It was on the floor by my bed. And what's more, it had grown. Chapter 3 Is it a bird? Is it a plane? Is it super maggots? So, now the dragon fruit was glowing and growing, I decided it was best to keep it out of sight of mum, dad and away from Tom Tom. So I pulled out one of the storage drawers from the wooden unit that was crammed with all my toys. Shoving a heap of little plastic play figures to, one, to either side, I placed the fruit inside. My hands came away covered in a sticky goo. Like it was oozing juice or slime. Remembering the possibility of a toxic meltdown, I quickly wiped my hands. Then I crawled into bed, eyes fixed on the drawer and the glow coming from inside. To be honest, it wasn't the behaviour I'd come to expect from fruit. I mean, bananas and mangoes never did this sort of thing. Even with kiwi fruit, you knew where you were. But this, frankly, it was weird. I had every intention of keeping a close watch on the fruit. But after all the digging and wrestling with the bongle weed... I was so tired, my nighttime vigil probably lasted about three and a half minutes. I don't know how long I'd been asleep, 
when my eyes suddenly snapped open. The room was dark, but there was still a glow from the drawer. Suddenly, the whole wooden unit began to rattle and shake in what... And that must have been what had woken me up. Then, just as quickly, it stopped. I peeled back the covers and crept out of bed. I switched on my rocket lamp and crouched down next to the drawer. Slowly, I opened it and peered in. The fruit sat there, glowing but unmoving. Had I been imagining things? I rolled my eyes at my own crazy imagination and then checked the room for the unicycling gorilla who usually turns up in my dreams. But there was no gorilla, which meant this was no dream. I turned back to the fruit and then jumped in alarm as it began to move, shaking the drawer again. And this time I clearly saw one side of it bulge. It was as if something was inside and trying to burst out. The skin stretched and the spiky leaves stuck out as the bulge moved under the surface. I thought of the worm I'd once found in a pear from Grandad's garden. What if some kind of monstrous maggot was squirming its way out of the dragon fruit? The thing twisted and writhed and pushed and I started to back away. There was no way I wanted a mutant maggot launching at my face. But as I took another step, I stumbled over King Kong and came crashing to the floor. I kept my eyes fixed on the still rattling drawer and then there was an almighty... Like a cork from a bottle, something shot over my head. A spray of mus messy pulp and little black seeds covered the floor and splattered my trouser leg. For a second, I just lay there, eyes pinned wide open. Then I heard scratching and a noise like someone striking a match. I spun around, eyes scanning, eyes scanning the floor to see where the maggot or whatever it was had landed. But all I could see were the toys I hadn't put away. There was a scratching sound again, like the fizzle of a match igniting. Whatever was making the sound was behind the beanbag. The match struck for a third time. I edged closer, keeping my eyes firmly on the mound of the beanbag. And as I went, one edge moved. There was something wriggling underneath, trying to squirm its way out. Where was Tom Tom when I needed him? He'd left enough sad little critters on my carpet over the years as presents, and he'd definitely know what to do with something, some kind of mutant fizzing worm. My heart was hammering in my chest. I'd have to run a mile, but I took my but if I took my eyes off it, it might slink away, and then I'd have to go back to bed, knowing it could be somewhere in the room with me. I grabbed a mug from the desk and stood up, ready to trap whatever it was. Slowly, very slowly, I lifted a corner of the beanbag. Every bit of me was poised, ready to jump out of my skin if the thing came shooting out at me. I lifted the beanbag higher, millimetre by millimetre, until I saw it, lying curled underneath. The mad hammering in my chest started to calm as I gazed down at the tiny creature in front of me which was most definitely not a mutant maggot. Although quite what it was, I had no idea. It looked like a bird, but it had a thorny little spines down its back and it seemed more leathery than feathery. It was bright, <laughs> bright red and its wings were scalloped, a bit like a bat's. And it shimmered in the light of my rocket lamp, like it was having trouble deciding on the very best shade of red to be. As I stood there, my mouth gaping, it raised its head, swung it from side to side and sneezed. Only what came out wasn't spit and bogies, 
but a bright little spark and a wheeze of smoke. And that's when my brain woke up and I knew. I knew for sure and no messing. What was nestled in my Batman dressing gown? Scratching its claws across Robin's head as it hopped from foot to foot was an actual dragon. See you next time for the next part. Bye.